Hi, good morning guys, and welcome back to Zoo School Live. My name is Laura. I'm Elisa. We have Elisa here, and then a very special guest hanging out in a crate right next to us. We're gonna meet in just a moment. Before we get started, we did wanna share with you some artwork we received. Um, so we have this really awesome thank you note from Faith, who's from Doylestown, PA. She sent that to us. Um, really awesome coloring job, Faith. So we're really glad that you love Zoo School Live. We love doing it. And uh, we hope you guys continue to tune in and send us your fan mail or any of the projects you've been working on with our animals. We really love to see all that. So um, you might hear our friend making some noise. We're gonna do a little bit of an intro about the type of movement we're gonna display today. So please just pretend like she's not making all those funny sounds for right now. Um, we're actually gonna be talking about flight today. So how animals move using usually wings. Um, now humans, the only way we can fly is by jumping in an airplane or a helicopter, right? Or maybe paragliding. We need assistance. Our bodies aren't really built for flight. But the animal we're going to meet today is perfectly designed for flying. So we actually have a pretty cool skeleton here. This is a pigeon skeleton. So a pigeon is a type of bird. And birds are specially arranged. Their bones are designed and, and put together in a specific way to help them fly in most cases. Remember last week we learned about some birds that don't really fly, but in a pigeon's case and the one we're going to meet today, they do have uh, usually hollow bones, so bones that are much lighter than ours to help them to fly. They also have some special bones in the front. They have a keel, um, which is kind of in the middle of their chest, and that's where their muscles are going to attach to. So birds have to have really strong muscles to maintain flight, um, especially because it does take a lot of uh, energy to get up off the ground, even if you're a very light bird. So typically we see birds with wings and they're going to start to flap those wings to get thrust, so to get energy to move their body forward. Once they start moving, once they've started flapping their wings, um, they're actually going to use lift, which means the air is going over the top of the wings very quickly and will actually release some of that pressure and help to rise the bird up off the ground, which is really cool. Now the bird we're going to meet today has very, very large wings, very wide wings to help her soar. So she is going to use a lot of energy to get up off of the ground or get up off of a tree, but once she's up in the air, she's going to actually use her really wide wings to catch different uh, bits of air, so thermals, which is like really uh, warm air currents to help her to fly and not have to flap very often. So she's a very efficient flyer. She works smarter, not harder when she's up in the air. So without further ado, I think we're going to show you guys how she does some of this flight. Um, so you will notice that Elisa has on a very fashionable uh, couple of gloves. We have um, falconry gloves that we're going to wear because our bird we're going to meet today does have some sharp claws on her feet. And then we also have a little glove that we use for delivering some snacks. So we've talked a lot about training and with some of our other animals. We do use snacks, and she heard the word snacks and got really excited. Um, we do use snacks to reward this animal for doing these different behaviors, um, even though flying in itself is something she really likes anyway. So we are going to be meeting a large bird. Her name is Hoover, and Hoover is a black vulture. And she's been here for quite a while. We'll learn a little bit more about Hoover's history and her natural history once we're done demoing her flying. But what you're going to see is she's going to come out here on a station. We've trained her that this nice little green patch is um, kind of her home base. So when she comes out to fly, she starts off here and then she'll also return to this when she's done. And Elise is going to head over to the back of the room there and uh, be ready to receive Hoover because right now we're working on her flying back and forth from person to person. And then hopefully you guys will really get a really good view of her coming in and landing um, and getting to watch those wings in action. So we're going to go ahead and get set up and have Hoover come out to meet you guys. bird but she's what we call an imprint so that means she's lived with people a long time so she doesn't really know how to be a wild bird so once Elise is ready we're gonna have her come out and she's gonna run over and grab that snack and then we're gonna see if she wants to fly back and forth a few times okay there we go we're gonna have her hop up here and we're gonna get a little more distance because Hoover is very good at flying the whole length of this room She's been working really hard to do that. All right, and we're gonna see if she's ready to 
go. <laughs> there we go. All right, we're gonna have her come on back. Good job, Hoover. So you can see those really wide wings. Um, they're very powerful flyers, so they are good at taking off because they have a pretty heavy body. But once they get up in the air, like I said, they're gonna use thermals, they're gonna use air currents to uh, do most of the work for them. Because it does take a lot of energy to flap your wings back and forth. It's very costly. And some birds that migrate really far distances um, have to stop and, and take breaks and eat. Um, vultures spend most of the day kind of swarming around while they're looking for food. And you know because their food does not run away, sometimes it can take a while for them to track something down that they do want to eat. So they need to save energy and soar instead of having to flap constantly back and forth. You'll see that Hoover has um, what we call white stars on the ends of her wings. So she is a black vulture. Black vultures are almost all black except for those little white stars on the end of her wings. That's one of the ways you can tell them apart from their turkey vulture cousins when they're flying because turkey vultures have a much larger white band along the bottom of their wing. All right, we're gonna send her back over to Elisa. We'll do one more big one coming this way. Trying to get a good angle for you guys. All right, we're ready. Good job, Hoover. All right, you can see she really likes those snacks. Today we're giving her a mixture of chicken and some ground up meat because she is a carnivore. Um, and we will try to reward every single time that she does that flight. Even though she really enjoys flying, we wanna make sure that she uh, knows that we, we're, we're saying good job. You did exactly what we're asking for. So we're gonna have her go back to her station and we're gonna have her go back in the crate briefly. again, to, to maneuver around their habitat, to try to find food. Um, does anybody know what vultures like to eat? We'll give you a few seconds to answer in the, the comments here. Vultures have a very particular um, set of favorite foods. And one of the things we like to do with her on program is show off her beak. So you guys saw that really long beak with kind of the little um, edge on the tip. That helps her to pick apart her food. Now, if you guys were taking guesses in the comments, vultures are notorious for eating carrion or dead stuff. So they're actually really valuable in our ecosystem and we'll learn a little bit about why later. But what we've got here is a pretend skull. So this is a replica, which means that it's not real, it's made of plastic, but it's designed to look real. And uh, we're going to stick some snacks in this skull. So we've got, remember the bits of chicken, um, some bits of meat, and what this is going to do is kind of replicate how Hoover would find and gather food in the wild. So she's going to come out and she's going to put that beak to use. You're going to see her try to pull all the good snacks out. And that's exactly what they would do in the wild. They would use that beak to pull the flesh and all the good stuff off of the bones of any animal they might come across. Stick a few more down here. And we do have it tied to the table because Hoover gets very excited sometimes, so we want to make sure safety first. But this is something we do with her for programming. So Hoover is an ambassador animal, just like the ones we've met so far. So she helps us to teach programming. And this is a great way to explain how a, a vulture beak works rather than us just talk about it. We want to show it. So without anyone waiting here, we'll let Miss Hoover come out and demonstrate her beak. That lovely biting behavior. So you can see she can really get in there really nicely. <laughs> and they have a very flexible neck <laughs> to help them maneuver around a carcass. Um, but that long skinny beak, that's really a, an important tool. It helps them get into every little crack and crevice. Make sure none of that food gets missed. <laughs> and uh, vultures can clean up a carcass very, very quickly. So this is a really, really important tool for her to catch, to get all that food. She's also pretty smart. She's gonna figure out how to flip it over there, get into that small space. Good job, Hoover. All right, I'm gonna have a few more little tidbits to grab. All right, is that it? Good job, all right. We're gonna crate again. Very good, Hoover. All 
right, so that's our skull picking behavior. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to get myself loaded up with some extra, extra snacks, and then I'm going to turn it over to Elisa. She's going to answer some of your questions, and we're just going to move our little skull friend out of the way as well. So remember, we're feeding Hoover some bits of meat today. She is a carnivore. She does not enjoy eating any kind of fruits or vegetables, so um, that's one of the reasons why we wear our, our fancy gloves to make sure our hands stay nice and healthy when we're handling Hoover. Okay. So, we're going to have her come back out, and I'm going to have Elisa grab my target stick for me real quick, because Hoover has another behavior she knows how to do, and that is targeting. Um, we've talked a little bit about that, I think, in previous zoo schools. So she is trained to touch her nose to the target, so we'll find out today if she wants to do some of that for me. All right, and then Elisa's going to answer as many questions as she can for you guys today. All right, guys, before we answer a few questions, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her really quick. Um, so Hoover is what's called an imprint. So what that means is that she grew up with people, um, so she doesn't actually really know how to be um, a bird. She actually kind of thinks that she's one of us, just covered in feathers. So um, we've had Hoover for quite a while. She does uh, seek attention. Um, she really enjoys flying, it gives her something to do, um, it keeps her body and her mind active. <laughs> um, also targeting is uh, another trained behavior for her. Um, she's getting some special snacks that she doesn't often get, so things like chicken uh, that she really, really, really likes, so I think that's why she's super, super excited. Um, her birthday is October 1st, um, 2006. So she will be 14 years old this October. All right, so it looks like Gretchen would like to know how she came to the zoo. Yeah, so she was an imprint. So someone actually had her as a pet, which is against the law. Um, so that's definitely not allowed. These guys are also a migratory species. So what that means is that when the you know food sources are going farther south, um, they're going to follow suit. So um, these guys, definitely not an animal as much as Laura and I love her very much and like working with her. Not something that you would like to have in your house, that's for sure. Jen would like to know, can they go on the water like ducks? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, so these guys are not going to be in the water nearly as frequently as, let's say, a duck. Um, so these guys are going to be roosting on the tops of trees. Uh, they also will kind of hunker down like a duck when they're laying down to maybe go to bed, but they're, they're going to be taking most of their time up in trees and sometimes on the ground, but not so much in water like a duck. Great question. Keith would like to know how big her wingspan is. So her wingspan is about five feet. So I'm just over five feet tall. So Hoover's wingspan is the length of the height of my body. So she's got some pretty um, decently sized wings, and I don't know if you guys can hear when she's flapping her wings, they make quite a lot of noise. So just like Laura was talking about before, the main diet of these guys is carrion. So they're eating the dead things. So they don't need to sneak up on their prey. So their feathers are really stiff and strong. So they make quite a lot of racket when they end up flying. Madeline Lynn would like to know how much she weighs. Hoover is one of our heavier birds um, compared to a great horned owl, for example, or a red-tailed hawk. So she weighs just around five pounds. Owen and Tyler would like to know why her head is so small and her body is so big. So it's interesting that you guys ask that. One of the reasons why her head looks so much smaller is because she doesn't have feathers on her head. There's a very, very particular reason for that though. It's so that guts and um, yucky things don't end up going and getting stuck in her feathers. So there's a reason why she doesn't have those feathers on her head and that's one of the reasons why it makes her head look smaller. And the reason why her body is so big is because she's got those big wings. Um, when we started flight training Hoover, she actually um, couldn't fly all that well. So maybe from the table to where I'm standing right now, so she could hop. Uh, so it took us about a year for her to be able to fly the length of this building, which is quite long. I want to say that it's about 50, 60 feet long. I don't remember. Something like that. It's quite a long distance, much more than a hop. Um, so she uh, strengthened that muscle that Laura talked about in the beginning, the heel muscle that's right in the chest in the middle. 
So she uh, eventually was able to strengthen that muscle and that's how she was able to fly long distances. Danielle would like to know why do they have sharp nails? So good question. So that's really what they're going to be doing is to grip on to their prey that they're going to be eating. So they're kind of holding it down with those feet. These guys, if you compare their talons or their feet to something like a red-tailed hawk or a great horned owl, if you guys can see, they are um, visible, the, the nails, but they're not nearly as big or as strong as something like a red-tailed hawk or a great horned owl. So those guys are capturing their prey, right? These guys are eating dead things, so they don't need to have super, super strong talons like other types of birds of prey. Ellie would like to know, do they fly faster than hawks? Ooh, good question, Ellie. So I would say speed-wise, probably not. I would say hawks are more likely to dive. Um, when you see vultures, like Laura said, when we were talking about thermals, they're going to try and not exert so much energy. So they pick up those thermals so that they can glide. So these guys are gonna be gliding and soaring a lot more than they are diving. So flying speed wise, I would say hawks are probably more quick. Hope and Griffin would like to know if vultures are relatives of any other birds. Yep, they are in the bird family. So these guys are related to all of the other birds. Um, you guys have probably seen turkey vultures more frequently than black vultures. Turkey vultures are often a little bit bigger than black vultures. They also have brown wing uh, feathers compared to the black feathers. And instead of those white and black heads like these guys have, they have um, those red heads. Josh would like to know um, if black vultures have the same V-shaped wing pattern that turkey vultures have. Uh, they do a little bit when they're flying. Now they're not quite as pronounced. Um, when they spread their wings, they're a little bit more flat, but that is a great way to identify them. They do have kind of that V shape a little bit, um, but turkey vultures definitely have more of a deep V, so these guys fly a little bit more flat. Great question. I'm glad someone you know has seen and observed some vultures in the wild. That's really special. We have quite an uh, intense wild population here at Elmwood Park Zoo of, of black vultures. If you've been to the zoo, you've probably seen our wild friends. Um, those are not part of our collection, they just kind of hang out here and um, have taken advantage of the fact that it's a, a fun place to live, there's lots of roosting opportunities, and there's sometimes a lot of free food because they do steal some snacks from other animals in the zoo. Um, so Hoover is our only black vulture at Elmwood Park Zoo who is supposed to be here with us. Uh, looks like Paige would like to know how old she can get. So she, I said, is going to be 14 years old in October. Um, so in the wild, these guys actually don't live very long. Between 5 and 10 years is how long they live in the wild. Um, in human care, so at a zoo, for example, or at a rehab center, these guys can live to be in their 30s. So they have a much longer lifespan um, in human care. Hunter would like to know what her babies are called. Uh, to my knowledge, Hunter, I believe that their babies are called chicks, just like most other types of birds, but um, maybe we can try and research that afterwards to make sure that that's actually true. It looks like a lot of people want to know how far, how fast, and how long she can fly. Really good questions. So the length of the hall is the longest, um, the length of this hall, the building that we're in currently, is the longest that she's flown. Um, so I, I can get a measurement on that and actually put that in the comments so that you guys uh, can know how long Probably she Probably at like least 100 feet, I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and how fast, um, I don't have a speed, but how fast she flew on camera is how fast she can fly. Um, we would like to possibly, if we are able to um, get some equipment on her, eventually try and fly her outside, but we would need to get some GPS tracking equipment on her first, just in case. Preston would like to know if you can see them flying around Pennsylvania. Preston, what an amazing question. Yes, you absolutely can. And it's really interesting because it kind of depends on where you are, on whether or not you're going to see black vultures more commonly or turkey vultures. So um, around the zoo, we have quite a, a number of wild black vultures who have learned that this is a safe place to live. Um, however, where I grew up in northern New Jersey, turkey vultures were much more prevalent, um, but I also saw quite a number of both when I went to school out in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. So it kind of depends, but we, in the United States, we have turkey vultures and black vultures.
Adi would like to know if she's friendly with people. So um, she is a bit friendly and that's because she grew up with people, right? I don't recommend going out uh, near wild black vultures and trying to make friends with them. Um, they would most likely fly away from you pretty quickly. Uh, the reason why she is seeking attention from myself and Laura is to look for that food. She is very, very food motivated, which makes training her um, pretty easy. Ashley would like to know what her favorite snack is. I would say um, chicken and this um, mice and rats. Venison too. Venison, so yes, she loves venison. Alex would like to know, does she chip things with her beak? That's a really good question. Um, not to my knowledge, she doesn't really pick at things very much. You can tell that she's got a really, really long beak compared to Killian's beak, uh, we met him. His was very like crescent shaped and a lot wider, um, and that helps him to you know grab certain prey items. Her long, long beak is to get, like Laura had said before, when we were looking at the skull, to get into the little nooks and crannies of all of the different um, parts of the body of the carcass that she would be eating. Kelsey and Jackson would like to know where Hoover's nose is. Um, so let's see if we can kind of point, yep, the camera right there. So she's got some nares, which are nostril openings, um, and they're those, those holes that are on the top of her beak there. Katie would like to know, does she have good eyesight? She does have good eyesight, Katie, but if we're gonna compare her eyesight to um, a red-tailed hawk, a so red-tailed hawk is gonna beat hers. So these guys are uh, really, really smart creatures. They really don't get enough credit. Um, they have, you know, a lot of people think that they're either a bad omen or they're gross, and they have some, some interesting behaviors. So, you know, a defense mechanism that they display is projectile vomiting, so that's a little gross. They also pee on their legs, um, but there's a reason for that too. That's to cool off in the really, really hot summer months. Um, it also gets all of that yucky bacteria off. Just like I told you before, they don't have feathers on their heads so that they can stay nice and clean while eating. So these guys really do a lot to make themselves um, nice and clean. They also will put their wings out in the sun to sunbathe. And that actually gets all of that parasites and bacteria off of her wings um, as well. So it uh, looks like Peyton and Mason would like to know why her feet are white. <laughs> yep, so her feet are white because of that pee. Yep, so her feet are actually black. Um, and they, they have turned this white color because vultures all pee on their legs. They pee kind of forward um, and it ends up coating their legs. Again, might sound pretty gross, but actually it's to their benefit. It cools them off when it's really, really hot and it also um, helps to kill the bacteria that is around and on their feet. I apologize if I pronounce this incorrectly, so I'm gonna try my best. Kaushal would like to know how often they shed their feathers. How often do these guys molt? Oh, Laura, that's a good question. How often do these guys molt? So typically they go through a molting process once a year. Um, they might not lose all of their feathers during that process. So they're gonna lose a lot of the ones um, that have some damage, you know, as you're an animal out in the wild, exposed to different elements like wind and rain, your, t your feathers are gonna get damaged. So they do grow new ones um, to replace those damaged ones every single year, but it kind of depends on um, the availability of food, Usually it's just once a year though. So if they have lots of good food, they'll molt out more feathers. Um, our birds here at the zoo go through a molt usually once a year, but it lasts a couple months sometimes. So they don't just lose all their feathers all at one time and then grow them all back. They would look pretty ridiculous if they had to do that. Remy would like to know how much she eats each day. So it's only relatively recently that we've begun um, training Hoover with this positive reinforcement. Um, and so that means rewarding her for, for displaying or conducting the behavior that we desire. Um, so it definitely depends on what we would like her motivation level to be. It also depends on the season. Um, so right now she's getting around 100 grams of meat. So she eats about 100 grams of uh, meat each day. All right, that's fair. All right, looks like we have time for two more questions. Uh, Isabel would like to know if she plays with toys. Yes, Isabel. So it's really fun to enrich Weaver. Um, we would give her things like boxes or we have these big plastic jolly balls that have holes or openings in them. 
<laughs> that she likes to stick her head in just like this. And we'll put newspaper or shredded paper in there along with meat. So she actually has to attempt to um, not really forage, but kind of scavenge like she would uh, in the wild. So she definitely likes um, toys that she has to work for. It also helps to keep uh, her motivation up and it also helps to keep her distracted and keep her busy. And then it looks like we're going to uh, have a happy birthday shout out to Addie. Um, happy birthday, Addie. Thank you so much for celebrating your birthday with, with us on Zoo School Live. And um, it looks like Addie would like to know if Hoover has any friends at the zoo. I would say that Hoover's best friends are the educators who work with her. Um, she lives next to, so she has some other bird neighbors. She again is an ambassador animal, which means she lives behind the scenes. Um, so she has other bird of prey neighbors that she coexists <laughs> with barriers. Um, but those who work with her are probably her closest friends, okay? All right, guys, I think that's all the time that we have for today. We are going to post a link for a related flying activity, so make sure you check out a comment. Um, if you would like to help out the zoo in any way, we'd be so grateful, and you can do so by donating to our emergency fund, um, which can be found on our website, all right? So from myself and Laura and Hoover, thank you guys so much, and Thanks, we guys. hope to see you tomorrow.